Numbers and music. What is the connection? Some people say it's obvious. Others don't see it. Well, there's a famous story, possibly apocryphal, about John von Neumann, who once in a lecture described something as obvious. Someone in the audience asked, but professor, is that really obvious? Well, von Neumann thought, and thought, and thought, and finally said, yes, it is obvious. And so it is with our topic. I hope by the end of the talk the connection will be more obvious. I'll start with a simpler subject that might seem unrelated, but which will lead us into the connection between numbers and music. I'll ask this question. How many different four bead necklaces can you make if each bead can have one of two colors? Here we can see three necklaces that are clearly different. But how many variations are there? So this is a counting problem. A first answer might go like this. Each bead has two options, and they're independent, so you have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 16 ways to color the beads. And we have a scheme here where a binary number describes the coloring. Zeros for black and ones for white. So the next necklace will be colored 0, 0, 0, 1, like that. People who've read my earlier work may notice that I used to do this the other way around, 0 for white and 1 for black. The new way makes the piano analogy easier to see. Moving along, the subsequent necklace looks like this. And we can go through all the 16 possibilities, which we start on the next slide. But look what happens when you list them all. If I gave you this one, and you said, no, I really wanted that one, who's right? They're actually the same. One is just a rotated version of the other. The more you look, the more duplicates you'll see. So how many different necklace patterns are there really? To answer this question, we introduce the concept of equivalence. We call two patterns equivalent if one can be rotated to match the other. When you do that, you partition a set into a collection of disjoint subsets, inside which each element is equivalent to all the others. So let's get started. Here are all 16 necklace patterns laid out in two dimensions. Going from one to two dimensions often helps us see patterns. Consider, for example, the periodic table. What we're going to do here is circle all the equivalent necklaces, sort of corral them with their relatives. The first pattern, all black beads, is the only one of its kind. The second, with one white, has four variations, or we might call them sisters. Then we look for necklaces with two adjacent whites and find them here. By contrast, the ones with two opposite whites are these. And here are the final two subsets. The pattern of subsets is somehow reminiscent of a multiplication table. And so here's the answer to the question I proposed earlier. There are six essentially different necklaces. And here they are. Now, we will see how this connects to music. When you play a major scale, you start with Do and proceed on through Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, and back to Do. It's an octave higher, but there's a very important sense in which we consider them the same. If you finish at the same place you started, why not connect the ends to make a circle? On the piano or guitar, there are 12 steps from one do to the next, and we will color, color them black or white in the same way as on the piano. This should remind you of our earlier necklaces, only with more beads. Before we get to the full 12 bead necklace, let's see what sorts of things happen as the necklace grows. Here's the complete set of six bead necklaces. We might call this the periodic table. Necklaces that are equivalent that is, related by rotation, have the same color. For the curious, I'll tell you that I set the colors by relating the R, G, and B components to parts of the binary number that represents the pattern. What happens in this situation is that, again, the necklace with all black beads is unique. There are six equivalent necklaces with one white bead. 
And there are all sorts of interesting groups of related patterns, ending with the unique one that has all white beads. Okay, so now let's look at the necklaces with 12 beads. There are many more cases to consider. But first, a digression. Why 12? Conventional Western music divides the octave into 12 equal steps. Is this the best way to do things? There is a certain bit of luck involved. The key idea, so to speak, is that if you start with C and go 12 times up a perfect fifth, you land on C again. Now, a perfect fifth means a frequency ratio of three halves. When you raise that number to the 12th power, it's almost a power of two, 129 instead of 128. So you are almost back to C, but not quite. So the equally tempered scale cheats a little bit to make things fit. Can we get away with this? In an equally tempered scale, the fifth is no longer perfect, but a tiny bit flat. The major third suffers more in the other direction. Part of the art of tuning a piano is minimizing the roughness of this. That's a topic that would take us too far afield. But there are certainly responsible opposing viewpoints. In the first chapter of the book, How Equal Temperament Ruined Harmony, Professor Ross Duffin recounts an event where theory and practice collided. The conductor Christoph von Dohany is talking about performing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. He says, The symphony begins with about two minutes of a D minor chord, but after that D minor comes a striking shift to B flat major. In rehearsal, I just couldn't get that B flat chord to sound right. I mean, I know what a major third is, and all of the players are consummate professionals, but we tried it over and over and I was never satisfied. Well, the problem is with equal temperament. A B-flat major chord has D natural as its third, but as we have seen, the tempered third is a bit too sharp. The musicians were probably hanging on to the exact D from the previous chord. Now, we mention this just to make clear that every Achilles has his heel, and we know that equal temperament has its shortcomings. For the rest of the talk, we will take as given the 12-note scale. What we will discover is that there are even more felicitous and fortuitous properties of the number 12. So, we're looking at the 12 bead necklaces now, but we'll think of them with their musical meaning. For example, a necklace with two white beads can re represent the musical interval of a half step or semitone. It has two adjacent notes. Of course, we could also call this a major seventh interval if we go the long way around. This necklace has some sisters, and here are a few of them. In fact, there are 12 equivalent ones in all. They all represent the same interval. What about other intervals? Here's another one, the major second. It too has a few sisters. How many different intervals are there in all? As it happens, there are exactly six of them. Many musicians have probably figured this out by themselves. Things get more interesting when we look at necklaces with three colored beads. These represent triads or simple chords. For example, here are some of the minor chords. Yes, there are 12 sisters here too. And here are the major chords. It's definitely more work to count these, and it's an important fact in music theory that there are precisely 19 different types of triad. And now to our central topic of scales. The distinction between a scale and a chord is just that scales consist of notes played sequentially, chords are notes played simultaneously. Picking a very important example of seven note scales, there are 66 different ones. Now, some of them might not be too interesting. For example, the upper one here consisting of seven consecutive semitones. But what about the other 65 scales? Let's start getting a look at the big picture. Here's a small view of the whole set of scales in the 12-note system, the periodic table. Here are three, there are 352 distinct kinds of necklaces in this system. Some of the important ones are circled here, the pentatonic and diatonic. I'll explain those terms as we go on. Here we zoom in on the top left corner of the picture. If you follow the link, you can see the entire image. Here are some preliminary observations. The first scale is the one with no notes. 
what we might call the empty or trivial scale. As with the previous examples, it's unique and for us not too interesting. Perhaps John Cage could make something of it. Again, if you go to the URL, you can see the entire image. The same sorts of subsets crop up as we saw earlier, and here are some parts of some of them. Of all those 66 seven-note scales, there is one of particular interest called the diatonic scale. It's also called the major scale if you start on C. Here we see it drawn on the circle. It has a special pattern of whole and half steps. It might be more familiar if we string it out on a line like this. There's the first note, which we can match up to C on the piano keyboard. We skip C sharp, but include D. And here are the rest. What's so great about this scale and its sisters? Centuries of musical intervention have not yet exhausted the patterns you can make from it. How can we explain this? A first step is to look at the interval content of the scale. What do we mean by interval content? Well, we can start by asking the question, how many major seconds does the diatonic scale contain? Here's one, and another, and more. So the answer is five in all. Now it might be easy to miss one counting this way, but there's a special trick that lets you be sure. The trick is borrowed from digital signal processing and is called cyclic autocorrelation. You start with two identical copies of the scale. Then you rotate one of them by the major second interval we are trying to count. Next, you line them up and see where there are matches. Here's one, and another, and some more. So we get the same answer as before. There are five major seconds in the diatonic scale. We'll jump straight to the full answer. The diatonic scale contains two minor seconds, five major seconds, as we saw, four minor thirds, three major thirds, and six perfect fourths. This scale is the only seven-note scale with this property. In addition, the count of perfect fourths is the maximum that a seven-note scale can contain, and this scale is also unique in this way. These two properties go a long way, but not all the way, to explaining why the diatonic scale is so popular. Now there's another special scale that I have overlooked called the pentatonic scale. It has five notes in it, and is even more common across the globe than the diatonic. In fact, you can get the pentatonic by just removing the half steps from the diatonic scale. It's like the diatonic scale without the seasoning of half steps. Taking that view, one version of the pentatonic scale contains the notes C, D, E, G, and A. But you can also get a pentatonic scale by just playing the black keys. This fact can be put in another interesting way. The diatonic and pentatonic scales are complements of each other. Just reverse black and white to switch between them. Here we see the pentatonic scale, but switch the colors, and you have the diatonic. Switch again, pentatonic. Switch again, diatonic. I've been told that this is obvious. Looking at its interval content, we see the same phenomena as with the diatonic, different counts for each interval, and with the maximum possible count of perfect fourth-fifth intervals. So this five-note scale is special in the same way that the diatonic scale is for seven-note scales. What else is hiding in there? What other properties does this pattern have? Maybe you can find some more. Here are some ideas to get you started. It seems that, with these scales, you need the least amount of local information to figure out where you are. In another direction, perhaps we could define some sort of entropy measure on a scale and see if the pentatonic diatonic has a distinctive value. When NASA launched the Voyager spacecraft, which is now leaving the solar system, 
they inscribed on it some images that were intended to communicate to other intelligent beings. How would you prove you were smart? Perhaps the binary expansions of 2 pi or e. I think the pentatonic diatonic pattern is just as special. The story is definitely not over. You can find more details at these links. And special thanks to my friends in Slovenia whose invitation to present these ideas helped me get them presentable.